Right, well, look, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 25. You know, if you think about it, yes, ma'am. I can, but I'm just scared that we're going to end up in that mode where everything starts squeaking. Well, I got a Oh, I got it. Okay, I'll be a good boy. I'll follow orders. Praise God. Yeah. But you know what? There maybe is a little bit of a spiritual truth to that. You know, just like that boy had to get up every morning and fight at the bus stop. You can't fight it in your own strength. But at the same time, there's a spiritual battle that rages in your heart and in your life. And you can't give up. Hallelujah. You can't give up. You can't throw in the towel. You got to keep on going. Amen. You got, but you got to keep trusting the Lord. And I know, what does that even mean, preacher? I mean, I don't want to take too much time and I'm going to get moving with the message because I do believe that the Lord gave me a message this morning. What does that even mean? Look, sometimes to walk with God, to serve God, to understand God, it doesn't happen overnight, Christian. Amen. When you give your heart to the Lord and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you, I got to tell you something. That's just the beginning. There's a whole lifetime, a whole process that has to be learned of a different life than the life that you used to live. Does that make sense what I'm trying to tell you? Think about it. I remember one time I was seeking God and I was like, Lord, I don't understand why why we as Christians, why we as your people struggle so much? Why did I struggle for, for so long? And I'm not saying I don't still have struggles today. Come on, man. But this is what the Lord told me. The Lord said, you lived like Adam for all of your life. What, is that, what does that even mean to live like Adam? It's talking about your first birth. When you were born the first time physically of your mother, the Bible teaches that you were born with a sinful nature. It's not really a genetic thing, but if you could think of it that way, you were born with a, ge a, a genetic defect called sin. And because of the sinful nature in you, you have a tendency, all of us have a tendency to go towards certain things. We're not all tempted by the same thing. Some people are tempted by different things, right? I can preach on that all morning, but I'm not going to. But we all have this genetic, this deep, this sinful DNA in us that pushes us. And, and the enemy's over there with like a little care, like, this is the stuff you like. Come on over here and get you some of this. It's like cheese on a rat trap trying to, to get us, right? But what the Lord said was, all of your life you lived like Adam. All of your life from the birth of your mother through all of those years when you didn't know me, you were living like Adam. You were living in sin. You were feeding your flesh. Whatever felt good to Matt, that's what you did, right? And then now you give your heart to me and you think thinking one day you're going to be like me and not be still like Adam? No. When you get saved, that's just the beginning, Christian. And now it's a whole lifetime of learning this book because this book is your new reality. Amen. Yeah. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? Okay, I don't, if you don't like the Bible, listen, it's okay because even for a time as a Christian, I didn't like the Bible that much. I'm just being real. But whenever you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart, you know you're not the same person you were the day before. So if you ain't saved yet, please do me a favor and give your heart to Jesus before you walk out of this place this morning. And when you get saved for real and the Holy Ghost comes to live in your heart, even though sometimes you know what you're feeling whenever you're like, I don't want to read the Bible. Let me tell you what you're feeling. I'm trying to explain it to you so that you'll know what you're dealing with. You're dealing with the works of darkness. You're dealing with spirits of, do you believe in a spiritual realm? This ain't even got nothing to do with, I don't know if this has anything to do with my message, but I'm here to tell you this morning, you don't have to believe it for it to be real. I'm telling you the devil is just as real as God. The word of God says that there is a real devil that a third of the angels fell with him and that there are demonic spirits. You cannot see them. They're in the, I don't know, I'm just saying it like this, the fourth dimension. It's a dimension that you, it's right here. But you and I can't see it. One day when we get a glorified body, we're going to be like Jesus. And we'll be able to walk through walls and we'll be able to see things that we can't see right now. But until then, I'm telling you right now, it's right here. Just like the message said when Sabrina gave that word, I'm right here. He's one touch away. The presence of God is one touch away. He's one call away. Guess what? The enemy of your soul is right there too. And he's trying to frustrate you. And he's trying to get you to go in a different direction. And sometimes when you open up the word of God, I'm telling you right now, that ain't the Holy Spirit. When you're like, man, I don't understand this. I don't want to read it. 
Or when you go to church and you get tired because the preacher uses too many words and he's getting on your nerves. I want to just get up and I want to get out of here. Guess what? That isn't the Holy Spirit, my friend. If he's telling the truth, that is not the Holy Spirit. That is a demonic spirit. Just like, just like whenever the music is going and, they're wor and we're worshiping the Lord. And, and you're like, listen, I have experienced that as a Christian. I remember going, being in a church. It's like, dude, are they going to play another song? <laughs> but if I'm honest with you, at that time in my life, even though I was a Christian, I was looking at internet pornography. Even though I was a Christian, I was guzzling beer in the backyard. You do what you want, dude. Oh, and I don't like that preacher because he told me I can't guzzle beer in the backyard. Live your life, man. But I'm here to tell you, I've been learning the hard way. I ain't playing games. I know the enemy in my soul. I know what he's trying to get me to do. He's trying to get me to go back to the world. He's trying to get me to act like the world. And all it takes is one little open door. And the next thing you know, Matt ain't only drinking, but he's smoking weed. And then whenever he's smoking weed, he's doing something else. And it's one thing after the other that leads to the big old mess. That's just me and that's my story. But I'm here to tell you, I've lived through it a little bit, connected to the word of God. And I'm telling you, that's a lot of what's going on. Whenever you, whenever the enemy, when you're feeling frustrated and it's actually something of God going on, it's the enemy trying to frustrate you to get you out of the presence of God, to get you away from the truth of God. Because if we're all honest with one another, we still got some flesh that needs to be dealt with. Amen. Including the preacher. Amen. All right. Let's get into the word of God. I, my message this morning, I titled, Don't Forget to Check the Oil. Don't forget to check the law, Christian. Amen. Let's go to Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. It says, And then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. Now, to explain that to you in modern times, you know, what that's talking about is it's talking about literally women that were virgins, but more, more specifically, women that had not been married yet and were waiting for the opportunity of their marriage. Back in the day, marriage was a big deal. I went to go visit my mom last night. Like, this is a completely different author. Not really. It's kind of... I went to go visit my mom last night because she wasn't feeling good. And she had Lawrence Welk on. Does anybody even know who Lawrence <laughs> Welk is? Dude, that's like old school, big band. And you had this big old orchestra. <laughs> and they had these three... Weird, they kept doing song after song after song. On uh, one of these songs, they had these three women that were dressed up in these mauve dresses, and they kind of like had this whole, you know, and they, and they were walking in unison, and they were singing this song, and then they would all three turn at the same time. And, you know, it was, okay, but this is the song. I had never heard of this word. Bottles, B-A-U-D-L-E-S, is that the word? No, what's the word? Baubles. I'm sorry. Baubles, not bubbles. Baubles. B-A-U, because I asked my mother-in-law, you ever heard of that before? B-A-U-B-L-B-E-L-S. It looks like bubbles, but it's baubles. Baubles, bangles, and beads was the song. Did anybody remember that? If you oh, if you don't, don't raise your hand because then you're gonna tell how old you are. And so these three women are saying, Baubles, bangles, and beads. And I said, Well, mom, what the, what is a bobble? She said, I think it's some kind of jewelry. Baubles, bangles, and beads. And so they were like, I'm going to wear these baubles, bangles, and beads. And they were singing about their jewelry. And then one day, I'm told it's going to turn into a ring-a-ding-a-ding. -a -ding. And what he was talking about is the man, when he sees all this jewelry on, he's going to put a ring on my finger. So anyway, there was a... I, don't know. I mean, nowadays, women would be like, are you even serious, dude? How, how you know, male chauvinist is that? Anyway. There was a time whenever being married was a big deal. And I got to tell you, it's supposed to still be a big deal. But what I'm trying to say is, is that in, in the Bible text, like a, a, a Jewish woman, that she longed for that. All right. So whether you can connect to that or not is another story. I'm here to tell you what, what's going on here. And so it's describing these 10 virgins. And it says they took their lamps. And they went forth to meet the bridegroom. And that's just another word to say the groom, right? And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. 
while the bridegroom tarried or waited, it took some time, right? They all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom comes, go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The little wick in there, they, they got some scissors or however they did it back in the day. And they trimmed the burnt, frayed edges of the wick. They trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered saying, not so, lest there be not enough. For if we give you some, we won't have enough. But you go rather to them that sell. You need to go get you some where you get the oil, right? And buy it for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the, buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. In other words, open the door, Lord, let us in. But he said, verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore... For you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. Father, we just come to you in prayer this morning, Lord. Holy Spirit, I welcome you in this place. I pray that you would use me as a vessel, that you would speak through me, that I would be simply a mouthpiece. But even more than that, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would anoint the words that come out of my mouth. Your word is already anointed all by itself, but I pray that you would anoint it for the hearer, that you would drive it deep in the heart, that you would allow it to accomplish your will for each and every one of us this morning in Jesus' name. Listen, on this on the surface, I got to tell you that what this what this word is saying is that it's it's talking about Jesus. Amen. Let's just get that, let the cat out the bag, for lack of better terminology. Jesus is the bridegroom. And the ten virgins are, in some sense, representative of us, the people of God. Right? And it takes time. Like, you know, the bridegroom went away. Just like Jesus died on the cross and he resurrected. And then he ascended to the Father. And then there's been a period of time known as the church age. And we're living our lives and Jesus, though one day, the Bible tells us he's coming back. Amen. Amen. The Bible tells us that the bridegroom is coming back. Yes. And according to the word of God, it says that there's going to be something called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. So once people are with God in heaven, there's going to be this concept called the marriage supper of the lamb where we'll be feasting and celebrating with God because now we're with the Lord amen and we were faithful to God as he gave us grace because you can't be faithful to God in your own strength we were faithful to God we chose God amen do you realize that there's a whole world out there that's refusing God you and I all were part of that world at one point in time, but we've chosen God. And now the question really for you, even in this place this morning for the preacher too, is, are we going to serve God or will we serve the world? And we're going to get into that a little bit more as we go. But I just want to give you the surface understanding of the parable. The word parable by itself, I'm not trying to get all fancy on you, but the word parable means to, in the Greek the word is parabolo. Para means side, below means throw. It means to throw alongside. You throw something alongside one another as a comparison and a contrast. And this story is comparing and contrasting the way that heaven is to a bridegroom with these, with these virgins that are waiting for the bridegroom to return. One of the things that's interesting to, you know, this passage of scripture has been preached in so many different ways. If you've been in the faith for any length of time, you've heard this message preached by multiple preachers and there's various interpretations. Most of the time, the interpretation is talking about the rapture of the church. I don't know if you've ever heard a message on it before, but basically you do you do understand what the rapture of the church is. Amen. The rapture of the church says that one day Jesus is coming home with the shout of the archangel and the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first and we who are alive and remain will go to meet them in the air. They got movies about it, man. You can go rent a movie about the rapture and, you know, the way they try to depict it is all of a sudden, boom, the rapture takes place and there's just a pile of clothes on the floor right there. People, people are driving and 
boom, Christians are gone and there's people getting into head-on collisions and there's chaos and there's mayhem all over the world. What happened to these people? They're all gone. That the word of God teaches that there's going to be a rapture of the church. And so a lot of times whenever people preach this passage, they <laughs> preach it as a rapture. But I think that if we focus only on the rapture, we're going to miss some of what the Lord's trying to tell us. So this morning, we're not going to focus as much on the rapture. We're going to try to see what God's trying to tell us in the passage, okay? And all the surrounding passages, if you go back and you study what came before it, we're going to read a little bit about what came before it, and all the parables that came after it, there's a common theme. And what the common theme is mostly focusing on what people are doing from now until then. Until he returns. Somebody wrote something called the dash one time. It was a little story or kind of like a little poem or a little idea. It was describing the dash on a tombstone. Born 1966. Dash died whatever the date was. The dash is from now until then. The dash is the story. Each individual in this place, each individual watching by video has a dash. The narrative, the story that's being written about your life. What happened in your life? What, what, what's the story that took place from now until then? Whatever then is. Whether then is the end of our physical lives. Whether then is Jesus coming back for his church. What happened in the dash is the question. And, you know, the life. How did, how did we live our lives? And, and when I say that, I'm not really talking about whether we were good or bad according to man's opinion on what good or bad is. But did they, did we serve God? That's, that's been something that's really been ringing true in my heart and in my mind lately. Did we serve God? What does it even mean to serve God? Does serving God mean, oh, I went to church on Sunday? I'm going to tell you right now, it doesn't. You got people filled with churches all across. And I'm not trying to say just because you showed up in this church that, oh, you showed up at the right place and that there ain't no other good churches nowhere else. That's, no, that's not what I'm trying to get at. But what I'm trying to say is just coming to church don't mean you're serving God. Amen. Just because you crack your Bible open and you read it don't mean you're serving God. Amen. Just because you sang Jesus songs this morning. You get what I'm trying to say. Did we serve God? Though that's the question I'm asking you. That's the, that's the question I'm asking myself. Matt, when it's all said and done, did your dash tell the story that what you did on this earth was that you served God? Did we serve him? Let me say it again. Did we serve him? And again, what does that even mean? Whose definition will we use? Will we use Matt's definition? Or the opinion of some other preacher? Or will we dig and search to find out what his word says, what it means to serve him? And then when and if we do find it, what will we do with it? Will we surrender to it? Or will we just pretend and go through the motions? Will we just go through the motions and ultimately again, in the end, how Will the dash look? All right. So that's kind of like the context of what we're going to take with the story. But I want to go back up a little bit further. I actually want to look at a few of the verses that came right before this story that Jesus told. If you move up a little bit to Matthew 24, verses 44 through 51, it'll kind of give you the surrounding context of what Jesus told this story in the midst of. He says, now in Matthew 24, he's talking about the end of the world. I want you to know that. He's talking about the end of the world. Some of it has to do with the rapture. Some of it has to do with judgment. But he says this. He says, therefore, be ye also ready. For in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man comes, who then is a faithful and wise servant, and whom his Lord has made ruler over his household? Now, let me just stop for one quick second and explain something. What you do with your dash today is going to affect your eternity tomorrow. What are you talking about, preacher? It says it in the Word of God. As a matter of fact, the parable after the one we're studying this morning describes the parable of the talents. What people did on earth with what God gave them and their understanding of God 
And in the end, what, God, what, what their position was in the kingdom of God. Now, okay, so, and, and listen, I want you to think about the kingdom of God because we're going to talk about that in a second. But it says, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household? In other words, God's coming back one day and we're going to live in the kingdom of God and we're going to be in charge of some things. That's what the word of God teaches. I believe it. He says, whom his Lord has made rule over his household to give them, it says meat, but it means nourishment in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. What does that mean? It means one day the Lord is coming back and blessed is the servant that's serving God and doing the will of God when God comes back when he finally does. Amen. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. If he can trust you today to do the will of God, he's going to be able to bless you tomorrow. Amen. And listen, oh man, I don't know if I really like that preacher's message. He was talking about the future. No, my friend, it matters for today. You got things going on in your life. You want God to touch your life today. You want God's grace and mercy flowing in your life. You want God to bless you today. Guess what? When you trust him and you serve him today, am I telling you it's going to happen? Man, I went to church three weeks in a row. <laughs> Sweetheart, it don't work like that. No. Gee, God, you, we got to serve the Lord through his grace each and every day. And as we're faithful, he puts little tests in our, in our pathway. And he wants it. Sometimes we're not going to pass the test. Right? Come on, Christian. Don't get all religious on me. Sometimes we're not going to pass the test. But trust me on this. You will get tested again. He's going to give you another opportunity. And good news, he never expects you to do it in your own strength. Oh, come on. I can't do it. No, you can't, but he can. Not that I know you can't, but he already did. And sooner or later, when you get tired enough of failing the same old test, you will get frustrated in your own self. And you will cry out to God and you will say, hey, Lord, I need some help down here like Lauren Larson used to say. I need some help down here. Lord, I need your grace. Amen. And God will give you the strength that you need in order to pass the test. Amen. So that when he does come, he can find you doing his work on earth. Amen. He says, blessed is the servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. Oh, he's taking too long. And shall begin to smite his fellow servants. Now listen, I know we ain't going around just slapping people. At least I don't think we do. Maybe you're old man. You do know that you ain't supposed to go around just slapping people, right? I mean, even if they look at you cross-eyed and they say something about your mama, you're not supposed to just go haul off and slap them. But, you know, maybe we're not slapping people, but I mean, how are we treating people? Right. Because really what it's talking about is, is that, look, you know what? The Lord ain't coming. I, I, you know what? I believe I believe in the Lord. But guess what? It's been a long time, my friend. And I'm just kind of, like right now where I am in my dash, I'm just kind of doing my thing. And I'm about to tell you about yourself. I'm about to let you know because I don't like the way you're treating me. I don't like the way you're acting towards me. And I'm about to give you a what for. Maybe it's not with my hand, but I'm about to tell you about yourself. Guess what? It's treating people improperly. I'm not trying to tell you to be perfect, but what I'm trying to say is... Jesus handled his business a certain way. And the same spirit that raised him from the dead also lives on the inside of you. And so you can't just live your life any old way that you want to and expect that that means that you're serving the Lord. That you can't live your life any old way you want to and expect that when he returns, he's going to find you doing what it was that he wanted you to do. Whenever you're like, you old dumb girl working in Burger King, you got my order wrong again. And yeah, I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not hopefully nobody here works in Burger King because I'm not talking about it. I just that just came. Yes, ma'am. You do right now. Okay. But anyway, my point was is that it wasn't. That's, that was funny. I I could say something right now, but I'm not going to do it. But what I'm trying to say, I'm just trying to use that as an example, right? Because I've seen, I've, I've gotten aggravated with the people. Right. Now, maybe not Burger King, because I ain't been to Burger King in a while. But, like, you know, somebody that's supposed to be serving me, because that's their job. 
and they don't seem to be doing a very good job of it. And I know that when I serve people, I try really, really hard. I don't get it right all the time, but boy, it aggravates me. And so, and I gotta be honest with you, like, you know, anyway, you get the point I'm talking about. The Lord's carrying. He's not coming as quick. Oh, I'm in the mid, this little bad spot in my dash. I'm just going to go ahead and give him a what for. Right? And not only that, but he didn't just begin to treat people improperly, but he started to eat and drink with the drunkards. In other words, he started hanging out with the world. Started doing what the world was doing. It, listen to me. You, you can't live a lifestyle when you're doing everything that the world's doing. It's not, I can break it down for you in the word, but we ain't going there today. It is not God's will for us to get drunk. It's not God's will for us to do drugs that change the chemical structure of our mind. It's not God's will that we do that. It makes it clear that that's against God's will. Do we have struggles in our life? Yes. Do we need freedom and liberty and deliverance from the Lord? Yes. But what I'm trying to say is, is that if you think in your mind that this is normal behavior and that this is Christian behavior and that you're a servant of the Lord, I'm here to tell you, no, that's not what the word of God says. Yeah. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looks not for him. You know, we can pretend, but living worldly makes us hard. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. When we live a worldly lifestyle, our heart becomes callous. Our mind becomes hard. God becomes more distant. And we're just kind of like going through the motions. And we're kind of like forgetting the things of God. And we're very focused on what it is that we're doing. Can I get an amen? Yeah. That, that whenever we live according to a worldly standard, when we start rubbing shoulders with the world, when we start flirting with the world, when we start kissing on the world, I'm just trying to say that the things of God become distant towards us. And we become hard in our heart towards the things of God. And many times we think that we're okay when in reality maybe we're not. It says that he will come in an hour that we weren't aware of. Why? Because we were just hard. We weren't looking for him. And he shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Oh, preacher, are you trying to say that because I drank last week and I'm going to hell? That ain't what I'm even saying. That's not what I'm trying to say. So don't let the devil lie to you. I'm trying to make a point. I'm talking about a lifestyle. I'm talking about the dash. I'm talking about did we serve the Lord? What's going to be the testimony of our life when it's all said and done? That is the direct context that we should view this parable of the virgins from. The parable starts with this too. You remember this? The kingdom of heaven is likened unto. When I used to read this, I did not have a clue what it meant. I'm thinking, oh, okay. That's up in heaven. I ain't going to worry about that because I'm down here. No, no, no. You remember that? You remember how Jesus told us to pray? When you pray, pray like this. Yeah. Father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy be your name. Your kingdom come. Well, what are you talking about? What, what do you mean your kingdom come? Your kingdom's not already here. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, the reality of it is, is this. God has always had a piece of his kingdom on this earth. He had called a man named Abraham. We studied about Melchizedek. I'm not going to get into that Wednesday night, but he always, he had a, a man named Abraham. By the way, Troy had a good question at the end of my Wednesday night teaching if you were here. He's like, dude, what does that even mean? And what he said was the order of Melchizedek. I never even really explained all that. It's because it was the difference between Levi. Okay, anyway. I was, I'm going to remind you of that Wednesday night. That was a good question. But what I'm trying to say, though, is this. God has always had a witness in the land. God has always had a people on the earth that represented him. He had people before there was an Abraham. He called Abraham. From Abraham, he created the nation called Israel. From Israel, he gave us Jesus. Now that we've had Jesus, the gospel goes forward, people get saved, there's Christians on the earth. God's always had a representation on this earth. Amen. Amen. A portion of heaven has always been on this earth, but the earth itself is in a fallen condition. Yeah. The, the, the kingdom of heaven 
what is present in the believers of God. The kingdom of heaven was resident in Jesus when he came down here. Whenever you and I get saved, a portion of the kingdom of God is deposited on the inside of us as the Holy Spirit lives in us. But that's why Jesus said, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. What's God's will? Not for you to get rich. Not for you to live in the best house. Not for you to drive the best car. You listen to some preachers on TV. You'll think that's God's will. God's will is that people's hearts, souls would be saved. God's will is that people would serve him. God's will is that people would shun the world and embrace him. And that they would live their dash in such a way that it would give him glory. That's the word of God. That's the will of God. That's what it teaches in his word. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto. It's not talking about what's going on just up there. It's talking about down here. We're, we're down here. It's talking about his kingdom on earth. Amen. And this whole parable is describing the people of God on earth and how they're living their dash. I believe that. I mean, like, think about this. I mean, yeah, we're waiting for the bridegroom to come back. It, dis it does sound like it's talking about the rapture. But just imagine you woke up today and you went out to meet the bridegroom. You went out to meet the Lord, right? Each and every day we go out to live for the Lord. We're looking for God in our lives. Amen. Does that make sense? So let's just kind of look at it like that. The first thing I want you to know is they all knew God. They all had lamps. Does that make sense? They all had lamps. Whether they were really saved or fake saved, you can figure all that on your own. But I will tell you that they all had access to the light of God. They all had access to the light of God and they all believed in the light of God. They all had lamps. They all had light. The Bible says that the bridegroom tarried. It means that it took a while. I know I've already said that in my introduction. It took a while for the bridegroom to show back up. That means that Jesus didn't come back as fast as they thought he would. It didn't happen exactly the way they expected it would. Days went by, weeks, even years, and he still hadn't come yet. You know what? Sometimes you wake up and time has passed you by, and sometimes it didn't go the way you expected. I can tell you one thing, my friend. This Christian journey has not gone exactly the way that I expected. There have been some speed bumps in the road. There have been some things that have taken place in my life that I did not expect it to go down the way that it did. You know, whether it was partially my fault, whether it was whatever, I don't really know all the ins and outs, and I can't tell you all the details, but I can assure you that this Christian journey has not turned out exactly the way I expected. Right, right. And if you're looking for every day to be like rainbows and, you know, sweet dessert, fluffy clouds. I love fluffy clouds when they're white and the sky's blue. I really do. I like looking at it. I'm like, man, look how God is. Good God is. I think it was because when I was moved to Singapore, we were, we were flying through fluffy clouds. But life ain't going to always be a fluffy white cloud on the blue sky. Sometimes there's rain clouds, my friend. Sometimes there's lightning. Sometimes there's tornadic activity. Sometimes there's hurricanes in the Gulf. Sometimes the storms of life are real. And guess what? The good man Terry. Hallelujah. Uh, it took time. It didn't happen the way that you thought it was. And it didn't happen as fast as you thought it did. And guess what? It starts to affect the world around you. Listen, back in the 80s when I was growing up, dude, I, I already told you I was a pothead. I was this, that, and the other thing. But I specifically remember being at a party with my old long hair, getting wasted with everybody. Trying to, you know, I don't know if I was trying, but I thought I was the life of the party. Oh, yeah, man. Ha, ha. Make everybody laugh. It's all good in the hood. And then all of a sudden, somebody made fun of Jesus. I'm like, dude, what is your problem, bro? What you doing talking about Jesus like that? All of a sudden, I'm trying to take up for Jesus in the middle of the party. What I'm trying to say is life has changed even since the 80s. Back in the 80s, dude, we had somewhat of a reverence for God. That dude was about the only guy in the house, as far as I know, that was going to make fun of Jesus. But nowadays, as time goes on, there's scoffers in the last days. That's what 2 Peter says. I'm trying to say Jesus is tearing. It hasn't happened as quickly as it had. The world says that in the end days, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 4, 
knowing this first, before the end, <coughs> that there shall come in the last days scoffers. There's going to be people that are making fun of the things of God. There's going to be people that are making jokes about the things of God. And he goes on to say this, walking after their own lusts. <laughs> Help us, Lord. I won't even get into all that. Because you know what? Even as Christians, sometimes we do that. You know what a lust is? Sometimes we think, I mean, I'm not trying to be weird, but some, like if you're a man, maybe you thought some woman was good looking. Or if you were a woman, maybe you thought some man was good looking. You were like, oh, man, look at that. You know, you started imagining all this stuff in your mind and you start thinking, like, yeah, that's one form of lust. But the word literally means a desire for something. And depending on the context, it can be a good desire. I, like you could say, it sounds weird, but you could say, I have a lust for the presence of God. I mean, in the Greek it would be, I have an epithumia for the presence of God. But it could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. Anything that I desire that I'm not supposed to desire, according to the word of God, is a bad kind of lust. And people, it says in the end days, people are just going to be going after their own lusts. And saying, that's their mindset. That's the mindset of the people in the last days. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep. Now right there it's talking about since the Old Testament people died. All things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. There ain't nothing really changing. Oh, they've been saying God's coming back for a long time. But God ain't never come back. All this stuff, man, that's a bunch of silliness. And the reality of it is, though, is that I want you to know we're, that's the world. But, the, but you and I in the church, not that we think that God's not coming back, but we can become hard in our mindset. We can become lackadaisical because it's been taken so long and we've been in the faith for, for so long and nothing's really happened. And we just kind of get ourselves caught up in the motion. Listen, they all had a lamp, but they also all fell asleep. I'm not trying to make more out of it than what it is because really what that just describes is, is that it took time. Like time was passing by and they fell asleep. It's really just describing that a long portion of time went by and life continued on and it's easy to get tired. It's easy to get tired. It's even easy to fall asleep. And most people at some time in their walk find themselves getting sleepy. Don't get religious on me. Don't look at me like you the fireball for Jesus and that everybody else might be sleepy, but you ain't sleepy. Because trust me, if you ain't sleepy right now, at some point in time, and I'm not talking about I'm, my message is boring and you're going to sleep. Right? <laughs> I'm talking about spiritually. Right, right. It's easy even to fall asleep. Most people at some point do. The Bible says that they all went to sleep in the story. The nature of people is that they just get bored. I don't know about you, but I know myself... Sometimes I can get bored with things. People are always looking for something new and exciting, right? People are always looking for something new and exciting. And when it seems like it's the same old thing over and over again and nothing really changes, we can all fall into a trap and fall asleep. Man, I've been going to that same old church all this time. And ain't nothing really any different to get up every Sunday and go, well, guess what? brothers and sisters, let us all seek after the, the fire of God. Let us all let God rekindle a fire on the inside of our bellies and on the inside of our heart. Let us all ask God to make us hungry for the things of God, that we would walk after God and that he would do something in our heart and in our lives that would change our dash. First Thessalonians chapter five, verses 10. I'm sorry, verses two through 10. It's talking about this sleepiness that can happen to the body of Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the church of the Thessalonians. He says, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so, so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, everything's fine. Everything's going good. Then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman. Like when a woman is with child and her water breaks. And all this, that's a game changer, bud. I mean, I've never had a baby, but I've seen babies be born. And I've seen when water breaks and I've seen when a woman goes in labor. And granted, every woman might be a little bit different. But I'm telling you right now, it's like one minute you're like this one minute 
And it's a whole different ball game than that. There's a whole lot of travail going on. Can you imagine that, though, whenever the Lord comes back? Can you imagine the pandemonium? Can you imagine? It's like, oh, my gosh. It'd be like your water broke. It's like, dude, it was all good up until about an hour ago. And then now, wow, everything's different. And, and there ain't no going backwards. That baby's coming out. And whatever God had intended to happen is going to happen. And you're going to have to go through the labor. Yeah. You're going to have to go through. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not of the darkness. Wow. Brothers and sisters, you and I are not of the darkness. If you're born again this morning, if the Holy Spirit lives in your heart, you and I have access to the Word of God, have access to the grace of God. And the Word of God tells us that you and I should not be caught in darkness, that that day should overtake us as a thief. You and I ought to know that the Lord is coming back, that the bridegroom is coming back. Though he tarry, he said he is coming back. And you and I ought to know that there's a temptation to get sleepy. And you and I ought to know that there's a temptation that in our dash, a season of our life, that we might seek after our own lust, that we might go back towards the world a little bit. We ought to know because the word of God told us that even the people of God sometimes can go in a wrong direction. It doesn't mean you're not saved this morning, but what it means is, is that there is that there's a there's a chance that as every day goes by, you kind of just get tired and bored. Amen. Help us. Amen. He said, verse six, therefore, let us not sleep as do others. But let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. <clears throat> they, I mean, I, listen, I just want you to think about that for a second. He's equating sleepiness and drunkenness in the same way. If, if you think about it, I kind of wrote something down in my notes, but I was thinking, why is he calling sleepiness and drunkenness almost like it's the same, kind of like the same thing? Because it alters our consciousness. I'm not talking about our conscience. It does that. It can do that too. But it alters our consciousness. When we drink, when we do various things, it kind of numbs us to our immediate reality. For like that little moment of time, whenever I'm on, whatever I'm on in that moment of time, it's kind of like, oh man, everything's groovy. But in reality, when I wake up tomorrow, it ain't going to be so groovy. Amen. And I'm going to have to find some more stuff to alter my consciousness because it ain't too groovy. Right. When I'm asleep, unless I'm having a nightmare, it's like I'm not dealing with the reality that's around me. Does that make sense? Spiritually, that's what he's talking about. He's equating this spiritual condition where we just fall asleep. Where... We're just, oh, yeah, the Lord's not really going to show up. And so, you know, same old thing every day, just falling into the same old thing. But look what he says. But let us who are of the day, see, because you're of the light, you're of the day, amen, be sober. He's talking about spiritually, be sober. And then he says this, put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. You know what that's talking about? That's talking about, it's talking about the, 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 um, the armor of God. We've taught about that before in the book of Ephesians, where it lists the whole thing. But, you know, whenever I taught the armor of God, you know, one of the things that I saw about all these, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, all those things are describing Jesus. So what he's saying is, let us not be drunk as in the night. Let us not be asleep, but instead let our mind be on the Lord. Let our mind be focused on the Lord and the things of God. And that's really what my whole message is about this morning, that we would be mindful of God, that we would live our lives in such a way that he would be the focal point of our lives. Amen. And not various aspects of the world that we would get so caught up. Come on, help me out, somebody. Preachers telling you the truth. We can get so caught up in our day job. Not even, dude, dude, I don't even drink. I don't even do whatever you were talking about. Okay, well, well good for you. We, we can get caught up in our day job. Yeah. Right. What, what are you talking about? Our finances. Yeah. Our material possessions. Yeah. Our relationships. Yes, sir. I, you know, being popular at school if I'm young. Mm -hmm. Don't want people to think I'm a weird Jesus freak or whatever. I mean, that's, that's what I would, would have said. But what, I, but what I'm trying to say is we can all get caught up in something that diverts our attention from what is important, which is Jesus, 
to putting it on something else. He says, for God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. There's no difference between, listen, I, I, I don't want to, don't say I won't fall asleep. They all fell asleep. And living for God isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. And the things of life don't always, again, go the way that we expected it. Listen, they all trimmed their wicks. They all, I don't know if they had scissors back then or if they had like some kind of a sharp knife and they had to just grab the frayed edges. I don't know how they did it, but they all trimmed their wicks. And when you have a lamp, you have to trim the wick. It's just part of what you have to do. Does that make sense? One of the meanings of the word trim is actually to decorate. And this is how the Lord revealed it to me. They all had lamps. They all trim their wicks because that's what you do when you have a lamp. You got to trim the wick. You have to trim it to make it look right. When you don't, the wick is ugly. The flame is ugly. It burns dirty. It's just what you do. Don't lose me in all of my words this morning. When you have a lamp and you got a wick, that's what you got to do. You just got to got to trim the wick. But when you're trimming a wick that's in a lamp that doesn't have any oil, you're simply going through the motions. You're just doing what's supposed to do. It's like a decoration. I got a, I got a, I got a lamp. It's got a wick. I got to trim it because that's what you do when you got a, a lamp that has a wick. It's kind of like a person using makeup to hide a flaw, dressing up to play the part. We're Christians. It's what we do. Everybody knows that we all do this. We get up. We put on our clothes. We go to church. Then we go to sleep and we do it all over again. Everyone is trimming their wicks. Everyone that has a lamp and is going through the motions. But are we serving him? I'm preaching just as much to myself this morning as what I'm preaching to you. The question is, are we just going through the motions or are we serving him? Are we living our lives for him? Do we make decisions for our lives with him in mind? Amen. Oh, that's a good one right there. Because yes. right. <laughs> when you make decisions for your life with him in mind, when he's the focal point, I'm telling you right now, listen to me, I'm not, I ain't pointing, no, I'm just talking in general. So don't think that I'm pre tailor prepared this message for you. If you feel like it was tailor prepared for you, it's because the Holy Spirit Amen. is speaking to you through it, just like he's speaking to me. But whenever Jesus is the focal point of your life, you don't just go get a new job tomorrow. Okay. Because God may not want you to get that new job. There, he may, there may be a day. Whenever God moves you on mm -hmm. to the next place. Mm -hmm. But you don't just make a decision for your job just because you can make, oh man, I'm about to make more money. I done told y'all that story so many times. It's old and it's worn out. Mm -hmm. Whenever the people offered me that job at Doe Tree Hospital, I was going to make $10,000 more. And the whole time, I had nothing but a lack of peace in my life. What a no-brainer, dude. They're going to give me $10,000 more a year. Same amount of mileage. For some reason, the Holy Spirit was dealing with my heart saying, don't do it. Don't do it. Hard head. I'm just going through the motions. I'm like, what, well, $10,000 more? It's got to make sense. And I'm just still going through the motions. I mean, God basically had to, like, break the whole thing down or else I was just like a little... I'm going to the slaughter. Here we go. And I mean, I'm not making fun. I'm just telling you. Until finally, God made a way for it all to fall apart. Do you know that one year later, that whole clinic shut down? Wow. That whole clinic shut down, man. Anyway. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. And I know that the Holy Spirit was trying to deal with me. But I'm telling you right now. And you know what? You know what's even... Kind of more interesting. That was before my sister died. I was at best a carnal Christian when that happened. So it's understandable that I couldn't really hear from the Lord. Because I was really going after my own lust. I wanted more money in my pocket. But after that went down, my sister died. And God broke me. And in that, pl in that place, I was in the perfect place that I needed to be. I, I don't want to get into all the details. But... At the time, we had five nurse practitioners. Five. And there's only, I'm the only one left now. 
And I can remember, I became so hungry for the word of God that I started reading the word of God. And one time, and I, like, I kind of, the Holy Spirit would deal with me a little bit. And he's like, son, you're, they don't pay you to read the Bible when they pay you to see pages. But we weren't really that busy. And I remember my boss came later on. And I was like, hey, man, if I don't have patience, is it okay if I read my Bible? Man, you can read as much Bible as you want to read. Just don't make my patience wait. But dude, I'm telling you right now, like I read that whole Bible twice in one year, wow. the New Testament seven times, Proverbs 12 times. Dude, I was eating it up. And anyway, you get the point. God was dealing with me. He foresaw. Right. He knew the future. Not only was that clinic going to completely close down, he knew that I was about to face the worst tragedy of my life and that he was going to do a work in my life. I'm still in the same place today that I was back then. Yeah. I mean... Until the Lord tells me something different, I already tried that. I tried to leave. I'm not going to do that again. Unless he said, it's going to have to be clear. All right? What am I just trying to say? I'm trying to say sometimes we're going through the motion. We're trimming our weight. Because that's what you do. You trim our weight. And we get up every day and we do the same thing. Lord, help us. You know what the difference was? Naya, music group, y'all can come forward. <laughs> what was the difference in the story? The difference was the oil. Amen. The difference was the oil. And I don't know about you, but I need oil. Amen. What does the oil represent? The oil represents the Holy Spirit. Amen. And when you have oil in your lamp, you can't just live for yourself. You can't be a scoffer and live like the world just because everyone else is doing it because the Holy Spirit will deal with you. With your heart. And he reminds us that we belong to Jesus. And he reminds us that it came. It can't just be business as usual. Like it is with everybody else. And my prayer this morning. Is that the Lord would give us oil. I don't know about you. But I want the Lord to give me oil. Yeah. Amen. And I'm asking them to come up here. And there's another scripture where it says in Galatians 6, 9, not to grow weary in well-doing. I want to encourage you not to get tired if you're doing the right thing. Sometimes it might feel like you're just trimming your wig. But I hope you believe that you're hearing the truth of the gospel when you come to this church. I want you to know that it's encouraging to other people to see you when you show up over here. That we, that we show up to worship the Lord together. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Amen? I do want to close with this one last scripture. And then I'm going to ask them to worship the Lord. And I, I'm going to ask the Lord to give me more. But in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, the prophet Samuel took the horn of oil and he poured it on top of young David. And he anointed him in the midst of, every, of, the brethren, of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and then he left. The oil is the Holy Spirit. Jesus died so that we can have it. Not just to live in us, but to overwhelm us. To, to, to be poured upon us. For the anointing of the Holy Spirit to be all over us. To strengthen us, to encourage us. The anointing of the Holy Spirit, it makes the preaching and the teaching different. It makes the music different. It makes the response of the heart different. I don't know about you, but I've been, I'm, I'm saying, Lord, I need your anointing. Yes, I know you've anointed me to preach your word. I know your word's anointed, but Lord, Holy Ghost, I need you to do a work. I need you to ride on your words and enter into the heart of the people. I need you to change the people in the sanctuary. I need you to change the heart and the life of the preacher. We need the oil of your spirit, Lord. Please visit. Come and anoint us with the oil of your spirit. Let's worship the Lord. Amen.